Shalom, greetings to all and all. Salamta, Ines Lin. This is Ras Alonso Tafar reporting for the Lion of the Tribe of Judah Society of His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie I, and His Christ Jesus, HaMashiach Yeshua. For the record, this day is Sunday, May 28th, and 2017, and it is 11.35 a.m. Now the following work that we are to present, we do or we bring forth on the basis that to do what we can is to do what we must. If ones can perform it better, then by all means, feel free to do so. Now, a few key points, disclaimers, not really, but you know, something of that nature. The following text that we are to read, we must make mention that the names in Amharic, the Amharic names, the pronunciation of them cannot be assured that we will do it as accurately as it would have been possible if the names would have been provided for in the Amharic text or in the Amharic language. That is, we do not know the vowel system, the pointing on the vowel system that is utilized, which includes the English alphabet. And so we are sure that the pronunciation of Amharic names will not be precise and exact so let this be a warning to the listener and to continue we make mention that we are not professional readers as a matter of fact we did not begin to read up until uh, the age of possibly 25 and we are now 30 and that is because we were called to to Rastafari uh, we were called to Christ in light of Rastafari until that time we had no interest in reading. To add to this, we learned to speak and speak mostly Spanish our whole lives to this very day. Therefore, you know, if ones could do it better, by all means, bring it forth. And I just do what we can, and that is to do what we must. Chapter 1. The story of my childhood up to my appointment has dead just much. 1892-1906. My father, His Highness Ras Makonen, was the son of the Princess Tanakinya Werk, the daughter of the great King Sakhala Selassie of Shoa. His father was Dejesmanch Bolde Mikael Bolde Malakat of the Doba and Mans nobility. He was born on the 1st of Gembot, 1844, 8th May, 1852, at a place called Derefo Mariam in the district of Gola. Ras Makonen remained with his father for about 14 years. This was, of course, at a time when Menulik II, the son of Makonen's uncle, King Hayalet Malakot, was still only king of Shoah. His father, Dejesmach de Mikael, then took him to Menulik and said, Let this, my son, your aunt's offspring, grow up with you in your place, in your palace. And Menulik made Makonen his special companion, quite apart from the chance fact of their family ties. Subsequently, since King Menulik had become convinced of Makonin's loyalty and skill in the service of his government, having tested him many times in various tasks to which he had appointed him, he raised him to the rank of Balambaras when he was aged 24 in the year 1868-1876. At this time, Makonin married Waizero Yashimabet, my mother, as his lawful wife. While Menulik II was still only king in 1879, 1886-87, he conducted a military expedition into the Harar region and restored the ancient province to Ethiopia. Since it had become known to him that my father was valorous in battle and a friend and leader of soldiers, he appointed him, at the time of Harar's occupation, governor of the town and its province as well as commander-in-chief with the rank of Dejismanch. And similarly, after Menelik II had been anointed King of Kings of Ethiopia, he appointed my father to the dignity of Ras in Miyazia, 1882, April 1890. When my father conducted military expeditions in the Harar region, he did so leaving behind in Shoah my mother, Waizero Yashimabet, his lawfully wedded wife, whom he had married according to Christian custom. When the war was over and the country began to be pacified, he let her come to Harar. 
He then secured the Ogaden region, which had not yet been incorporated within Harar province. While temporarily he still had to lay plans of war, he yet continued easing the tax burdens which weighed heavily upon the population. I was born on the 16th of Hamle, 1884, 23rd July, 1892, in the year of John at Ejersa Gorro, not far from Harar. Wazero Mazlakia, the daughter of my father's sister, Wazero Echt Amariam, had married Duchess Machayala Selassie Ab Abaina. When I was four months old, she gave birth to Emru, now Ras Emru, and the two of us grew up together as if we were twins. When we were aged seven, my father arranged for a special teacher for us, and we began receiving instruction at our home. In our tenth year, three years after beginning our education, we were able to read and write Amharic and Ki'iz. Our upbringing was like that of the sons of ordinary people, and there was no undue softness about it, as was the case with princes of that period. My mother, Wazero Yeshemabit, being barely thirty years of age, died on the 6th of Magabit, 1886. 14th March 1894 and was buried within the precinct of St. Michael's Church at Harar by the Epiphany Water. All this I heard, of course, much later from those in charge of my upbringing. Many were the months which my father, His Highness Ras Makonen, had to spend traveling to Addis Ababa and on military expeditions to other provinces of Ethiopia. More, in fact, than he was able to remain in his own governorate of Harar. He also went to foreign countries as envoy of the government. Here are some of the journeys undertaken by my father. In 1881, 1888-89, he was sent to Italy. In 1888, equal to 1895-96, during the Allegate campaign, he conducted the military expedition as commander-in-chief and was accompanied by Ras Wale, Ras Mikael, Ras Mengesha, Atikam, Ras Alula, the Jach Wolde Fet Aurari Gabayahul Gabayhu Fet Aura Fet Aurri Tekle Lik Amikwas Adenau and Agnazmach Tesfa Tefasa in 1890 equal to 1897-98. He undertook a campaign in western Ethiopia at the Sudan border into what is called Arab country. This is the region nowadays referred to as Beni Shangul. In 1891, equal to 1898-99, since it had been reported that Ras Mengesha, the governor of the Tigray province, had rebelled against Emperor Menelik, Ras Makonin was dispatched into Tigray and brought about a reconciliation between Mengesha and the emperor. Subsequently, in order to safeguard the security of the province, just as he had done when he occupied Harar, he remained in charge of Tigray for about two years and then returned. In 1894, equal to 1902, he was sent to England for the coronation of King Edward VII. In addition to all this, it was he who had to carry out and to con conclude the whole business of relations with foreign countries, which is nowadays undertaken by ministers of foreign affairs, and consequently, he had to go to and fro to Addis Ababa each year being summoned to consult with Emperor Menelik about every important matter as yet undecided. After correspondence by post and conversations by telephone, as the railway did not yet exist as it does today, the journey by slow march from Harar to Addis Ababa took a month. Since my father had been European had seen European civilization, having been to Europe twice, and since he was convinced of the value of education through conversing with some of the foreigners who had come to Ethiopia, he strongly desired that I should learn from them a foreign language. My father had established a hospital in his city of Harar and had brought into his employment a gentleman from the French colony of Guadalupe, Guadalupe a physician by the name of Dr. Vitalian. With this object in mind, my father arranged that the doctor should teach us French an hour or so a day when he could be spared from curing the sick, and so we began our lessons. My father had a strong desire to see the people get accustomed to the work of civilization which he had observed in Europe and to make a start in his governorate. It was for this reason that he had established the first hospital in the city of Harar. A year after my father's death, the French government purchased this hospital by the following accord from Menelik II, 
for 50,000 francs. The Lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed, Menelik II, elect of God, King of Kings of Ethiopia. May it reach Dejasmach Yelma, how are you? Thanks be to God, I am well. Mr. Klob Klobukowski, the special envoy and minister plenipotentiary in Ethiopia, had acquired on behalf of the gover government of the French Republic the hospital which Ras Makonin had established at Harar and to which the French government had brought a doctor to care for the sick of our country and therefore have the ground designed and dimensions of this hospital measured and have the title deeds written out and and co-signed co co -signed them to M. Nagyar, the French consul at Harar. Given on the 29th Hamlet, 1899, equal to 5th August, 1907, at the city of Addis Ababa, my father was anxious that I should learn French as quickly as possible, but because he became convinced that Dr. Vitalien's lesson for only an hour or so a day would not bring up closer to this target, he had a word with Abba Andreas, who was a resident in the city of Harar. He sent us an Ethiopian called Abba Samuel, who had grown up as a pupil in his mission establishment. He set out to teach us with care and attention. Even so, we did not give up our daily lessons with Dr. Vitalian. Abba Samuel, our teacher, was the son of Alika Woldekashan. He is the, the Woldekashan who was converted to Catholicism at the time when Abba Masias of the Italian mission arrived in Shoah. It is for this reason that his son Abba Samuel had entered the, the Catholic mission compound and studied there. Abba Samuel was, was a good man who possessed great knowledge, who applied himself to learning and to teaching, who in goodness and humility gathered knowledge like a bee from anyone who was devoted to the love of God and of his neighbor and who did not strive to find enjoyment of the flesh but of the soul. I am saying this because I had known him extremely well while we were together some 10 years. As has been observed in the preface of this book, I decided to write a record of my work beginning at the age of 13. Everything I had done prior to that was under the direction and guidance of my tutor. From the age of 13 onwards, although my physical strength may not have been great, my spiritual and intellectual powers began to increase gradually and thus had the entrance gate of this world opened. And this was the time at which I started to act on my own will, without being ordered by my tutor, distinguishing good and evil, and conscious that this action would offend others. That action would give pleasure, this being damaging, that on the other hand useful. And thus, I began to climb the ladder of introduction to the world, as the love that existed between His Highness, my father, and myself was altogether special, I can feel it up to the present. He always used to praise me for the work which I was doing and for my being obedient. His officers and his men used to love me respectfully because they observed with admiration the affection which my father had for me. I observed His Highness, my father, striving to fulfill to the best of his ability the Christian ordinances enjoined by giving his money to the poor in trouble and to the church and by praying at every convenient hour. As I grew up, the spiritual desire was guiding me to emulate him and so to conduct myself that his example should dwell within me. There was no one who did not know that my father's way of life was, a, was as described here above, either in the palace or among the clergy of the great of that period there are still several alive at the time this book is being written and everyone knows that it is not exaggerated as my father noticed that all my inclination was directed towards education his joy was constantly increasing in the measure of his affection chapter two from my appointment as duchess Munch to my father's death 1906 because of the strength of his love, my father was anxiously waiting for the time at which I, being sufficiently grown up, would attain to rank and, when I was thirteen years and three months old, on the 21st of Tikemt, 1898, equal to 1st November 1905, 
He appointed me Dejesmanch in the large region called Garramulata. But according to our country's customs, this dignity of Dejesmanch was for the sake of rank only. My age did not yet permit me to sit in judgment in court or to administer the governorate or to muster the army in battle order. And therefore my father gave me a chief administrator for all the work to act as tutor and deputy, namely his principal trusted servant, Fetaurari Tolach. On the day on which I was appointed to the rank of Dejesmach, my father's officers and his troops assembled and he introduced me to them in the great reception hall. After this I entered into the inner chamber where my father was and, because he had awarded me this dignity of Dejesmach, I kissed his shoe and sat down by his side. Thereupon the officers and all the chiefs of the army, having been summoned, once again came in. And when they were standing in front of His Highness, my father, he delivered the following speech. All of you are my servants, whom I have raised up and whom I love. Therefore I entrust to you with God, my son Teferi. His fate is in the hands of the Creator. But I commend him to you, lest you should bear him ill will. When the officers and troops heard this speech, they began to shed tears, saying, The fact that our master is making a speech like this about the trust seems like a farewell occasion, as if he knew that the time had come for us to be separated by death. While I was pleased that my father had bestowed on me this rank of Duchess Match, yet my joy was mixed with sadness at his delivering to his officers a heartbreaking speech like this. But the thought which my father had with regard to me when he gave me this high rank derived from long rather than short deliberations he had made prior arrangements with a view to my having a separate house for myself alone to live in he had given instructions on the morrow of my appointment to the effect that they should consign the house to me together with the officers required for each aspect of the work while all my father's officers used to like me respectfully also previously Yet afterwards they manifested to me their exquisitely respectful affection now that I had been appointed Duchess Match and had a separate household set up for me. Although my age did not yet permit it, I was yet allowed since my appointment to the rank of Duchess Match to be present and to sit down with the great officers came to my father's sit down when the great officers came to my father officially for business affairs or for a, a banquet. I could clearly feel the pleasure of His Highness my father and of the officers when I completed any sort of work which my tender age allowed me to pursue. When I listened attentively to their speech and counsel, and when I spoke of grave, of grave, of ga or gave answers to questions I was asked, I thank my Creator as I clearly recall how those of my father's officers who have survived until now sometimes tell me, reviving past tales. When at that time you were appointed Duchess Match, you used to tell such and such, being asked something like this, you used to answer something like that. Because my father was on his own after his wife, my mother, wise Roye Shemabet had died, he used to neglect his meal times and let them pass. But as there was nobody who dared to say, meal time has arrived. I would beg him in fear, entering his chamber and saying, Meal time has come, so please let it be your wish for dinner to be brought in. And consequently, he would order the meal to be brought in at once, with a view to pleasing me. When I saw him and the officers eat, I felt a sense of joyful pride in my youthful spirit, and my father used to commend me for doing this. His Highness, my father, had the good fortune to be loved and to be feared. If a man, however great his position might be, was found to be in the wrong, my father would determine the punishment according to the measure of his offense, but because he would not keep silent, they came to fear him. But a few days later he would cause pleasure by sending to the house a gelded ox, honey, and butter. If the convicted person was a great man of position or a cast or a castrated goat and money to buy honey and butter if he was an ordinary person. Indeed, the people would love him for this because there was nothing of actual cruelty in him towards the man against whom he had meted out punishment. Besides, even 
Even though no man is perfect and pure before God, since my father's main thought was to please God in every possible manner, he was determined to help with money those in difficulty, to reconcile those who had fallen foul of the Emperor Menelik, to offer prayers at any hour that remained from the work of government in which he was engaged, to assist in their troubles, the monks in each of the monasteries and the priests in each of the churches, that he was doing all this was part of his resolve to please God without being vainglorious. He was a fine example of good deeds. Chapter 3 From the death of His Highness, my father, to my appointment to the governorship of Harar, 1906-1910. Whatever may befall a man in this world, there is no one who concludes his days entirely in joy or in grief, but pleasure and sadness occur alternately in their turn. Hence, all my thoughts were floating in a sea of distress as my father, who loved me dearly and was so fond of me, fell gravely ill. His Highness, my father, departed from his city of Harar to go up to Addis Ababa on 4th Er, 1898, 12th January, 1906. At that time, he felt a little unwell. On the 9th of Er, January 17th, he camped by the Burka River and, after having spent the day celebrating the Timkit festival there, we went back because the illness took a stronger grip on him and entered his second city called Kou Kulebi, when he began, where he began to be treated by a doctor. At this time, as my father summoned me in his desire to see me, I went up to Ulebi. When I entered his bedroom to see his condition, and he saw me standing by his side, he motioned me with his eyes to sit down, since it was difficult for him to speak with his tongue on account of the severity of his illness, as I was convinced that it was his wish that I was not to part from him, I spent the whole day sitting by his side. But the hour of the judgment of death decided upon by the power of God cannot be postponed, even by the love of many, let alone by the love of one father and son. Thus he died at Ulebi on the 13th of Megabit, 1898, 21st March, 1906, and was buried in the church of St. Michael, which he himself had founded at Harar. After this, my father's officers and troops assembled in full. As on one hand, my father had said to them during his lifetime, I commend you to my son Teferri, and since in the second place, they were aware of my father's loyalty to the Emperor Menelik and his diligent services to his government. They expressed the hope that he, the Emperor, would not fail to give him Teferri, his father's governorate of Haraj. After they had concluded their consultation, saying, We shall go up to Addis Ababa following the memorial service, Taskar, customary after 40 days, a letter a letter reached the officers from Emperor Menelik, stating, Come at once with Teferi his son, for it is before me at Addis Ababa that the lamentations for Ras Makonin's 40-day mourning are to be held. While my father was still alive, he had prepared a present intended to be sent to the Emperor Menelik, and since it was an object he had put aside, we took it with us when we departed from Harar on the 3rd of Miyazia, 10th April, and set out on our journey to Addis Ababa. As many people died on us during the trip, grief was heaped upon grief. The reason was that the small rainy season was active and that because of the multitude of the army, malaria spread in our camp. On the 19th of Miazia, 26th April, we reached Addis Ababa. Emperor Menelik had given orders that the tents be pitched, sewn together like a hangar on a vast field at which he gave a memorial banquet for my father. And there he caused the officers and troops to assemble, while the lamentations proceeded. With the arrivals stationed at one side and the host mustered on the other, we gathered with Emperor Menelik in great mourning. On the 40th day, i.e. Monday, 22nd Miazia, 30th April 1906, the priest of the monasteries and churches in Addis Ababa and surroundings, after completing the prayer of absolution proper for Christians, all proceeded to the tent that had been prepared and spent the day at the great banquet arranged for them. The Rasas and Tejismaches, because some of them were his blood relations and others had grown up with them, entered the appropriate part of the tent stood there and observed lest any item of food should be missing. 
to the poor were given, apart from food, a lot of alms and cash. On the morrow, according to the custom of our country, on the fortieth day after a person's death, lamentations are being held as on the day of death himself, itself. On the vast field where the big tent had been pitched, officers and troops assembled. Emperor Menelik himself was seated in the center. And then the most amazing display of mourning was performed for my father when his ceremonial robes, his Ras's crown, his medals, and his battle arms were carried, and his horse and mule saddled in golden harness were paraded in the midst, midst of the army. One of the mourners composed in his honor the following dirge which he recited. The telephonist, when he announced his death, was wrong. It is not Makonin, but the poor who died. In the Addis Ababa palace, it was being said that no one knew an occasion when similar lamentation and mourning had occurred for anyone. After the demonstration of these lamentations had ceased, the ushers informed the assembled army that they should go home. They then departed and went on their way. But my father's troops, who had come with me from Harar, had remained there quietly. And when they were asked, Why do you remain when the entire army has left? They replied, It is to escort to his camp our master's son, Dejismach Teferi. When the emperor heard this, he permitted me to go to the camp with my father's troops. When we left my father's when we left my father's Adidva Ababa friends came to join us and to accompany me to the camp. All passers by on the way stopped and expressed astonishment on account of the extraordinary size of the escort. Owing to this event, other friends of my father's who were living at Addis Ababa, let alone my father's troops, told me they had heard people say among themselves the fact that the emperor is permitting Tejasmach Teferi to go back with his father's army may be because Menelik is thinking of giving him the governorship of Harar. But my elder brother Tejasmach Yelma, who had been born to my father before he married my mother Waizero Yishamabit, had married Waizero Asalafaj the daughter of Empress Taitu's sister. For this reason, Empress Taitu, used to supporting all her relatives, was said to be exerting herself with a view to Dejismach Yelma, getting the governorship of Harar, arguing that while there is an elder son, the younger son should not be appointed to his father's governorship. And because there had been delay in the announcement, very many people rose up indicating that the governorship of Harar should be mine. But since, on one hand, Empress Taitu had pestered Emperor Menelik by saying, Give it to Dejasmach Yelma for my sake. And because, on the other, the time had not yet arrived at which God had determined that I should become governor of Harar, the matter was decided by saying, Let it go to Dejasmach Yelma. The reason why my father's troops and his friends thought that the governorship should be mine was because they were used to, to me being constantly in my company, and because my father, when still alive, had said to them, I commend to you my son Teferi. After the decision to give the governorship of Harar to my brother Tejasmach Yelma had been taken, it appeared to me, though it appeared to be thought that it would upset me and the army if the proclamation were issued, while I dwelt in the midst of my father's troops, I was therefore summoned from the camp some eight days before the date of the proclamation, and it was arranged that I should stay in a tent prepared for me in the, in the palace precinct. Then they ordered some of my father's most loyal officers who had shown particular favor and affection to me, Dejasmach Abat Abor and Fitaurari, now Dejasmach Chayal Selasi Abaina, to stay here at Addis Ababa as suppliants threatening them for a time with royal dis displeasure and detention. The reason was that Dejasmach Abatabor and Fetaurari Hayal Selasi had firmly assumed that the governorship of Harar would be mine, and it was rumored that the advice had been given on the part of Empress Taitu that if they were now to go back to Harar, they might at every opportunity make things difficult for Dejasmach Yelma. Eight days later, on the 2nd of Gembot, 9th May 1906, the Emperor's proclamation was issued to the effect that he gave Harar the governorate of Ras Makonin to Dejasmach Yelma and Selale the governorate of Ras Darge to Dejasmach Teferri. As a consequence, 
My father's army as a whole was distressed. Among them, there were many who came to stay with me, leaving their home, saying, We shall not go with Dechesmach Yelma and abandon Dechesmach Teferi, our masters, Ras Makonin's son, whom he had entrusted to us. Among those who remembered me were Fetaurari, Fetaurari Kolach, Lij, later Dechesmach, Woldeselasi, Atodinak Gobaze, Lij Alama, Alamayahu Goshu, later Fetaurari, Agnazmach, uh, well, the Mariam Abaina, Ato Sabsebe, later Bajeron, Ato Haile, well, the Rufael, later Sehafe, the Izaz, Kanazmach, Defa Bacheu, Ato Teferau Bello, Agnazmach, Gebrewald, Ato Wake, later Dajasmach, Agnazmach, Tarbe. During the time when I served as governor of Salale, orders were given to reconstruct the church of the monastery of Debre Libanos, which had fallen into ruin. Hence, the foundations were excavated. There was found a ring and a piece of gold which was very fine and which bore an inscription. My deputy, who was carrying out the work there, sent it to me, and it reached the emperor through me. It was thus reckoned to be a great good fortune for me. Having gone according to the custom of the country to the governorship of Salale, the emperor yet permitted me to stay with my retainers. Since I did not wish to be separated from the emperor, it was arranged that my deputy should reside in the governorate of Salale while I spent the whole day at the Addis Abeba Palace from 7 a.m. till 8 p.m., eight whole months of attendance at court. At that time, Emperor Menelik had opened a school for young Ethiopians to study foreign languages and had brought teachers from Egypt while selecting Lejiasu, Lejberu, Lejigetacho, and other sons of, of the great nobles and placing them at that school, he left me out. And this was a matter of great sadness to me. But when I spoke to him a few days later, Revealing my desire to study, he gave me permission and said, It is because you were a governor that I thought you, sh you chose to live like the nobles. But if you wish to study, then go and learn. Thus I began my studies. But while at Harar, I had learnt French. Now at Addis Ababa, since it was not appropriate to take lessons together with the beginners, they began to teach us separately, fixing some hours for us alone. Those of us studying together with the Lij, Later Ras Imru, Ato Asefeu Banti, and Lij Zaute Gobana, later Fit Aurari. After I had remained for about a year in my appointment over Salale, I was appointed to the governorship of Basel. My brother Dejas Smach Yelma, after having governed for about 17 months, following his appointment over Hararj, died at Harar on 29th Meskarem, 1900. 10th October 1907, and when the sad announcement was transmitted by telephone to Addis Ababa and we had grasped it, there was great mourning. Afterwards it began, it again began to be said by the mouth of every man that the governorship of Haraj was to be given to Dechesmach Teferi. But as I have said before, since the time had not yet arrived which God had determined for me to become governor of Harar on 27th Magabit 1900, 4th April 1908, the governorship of Harar was given to Dechesmach Belcha, while the emperor gave me part of the governorship of Sedamo. Therefore, I had to abandon my studies and was ordered to proceed, together with the army, to my governorate of Sedamo and to take care of the business of government. It was arranged that some 3,000 men of my father's army at Harar should come to me. When my departure for Sedamo was decided, it was conceded to me that Dechesmach Abat Abor and Fetaurari Haila Selase, who had remained in nominal detention, should go with me. Since Dejasmach Abat Abor was alert in everything he did as well as firm in his word and truthful without any falsehood, whatever, this was to me a matter of great good fortune. During the period I served in my governorate of Sedamo, I had a time of, of perfect joy as I encountered no trouble whatever because there worked for me Dejasmach Abat Abor, being responsible for outside work, and my grandmother, my mother's mother, Y. Zero, Walet Agiorges, being responsible for the inside work. While I knew 
that it was proper to exercise judicial functions. A provincial governor, according to local custom, would sit in court. Up to now, I had not dared exercising those functions of sitting in judicial assembly, seeing the tenderness of my age. But now, since my appointment to the governorship of Sidamo, I began to pronounce judgment while sitting in court on Wednesdays and Fridays. While I divided my own previous servants, those who had come to me from my father's army, and the newcomers who had entered my service after... I had gone to Addis Abeba into three parts making proper adjustments for each according to their rank and assigning their duties. I remained there very happily for about a year. Then when I heard in 1901-1908-1909 that the emperor was gravely ill, I asked for permission to come to Addis Abeba. As the emperor's mass missive reached me, allowing me to come, I went to Addis Abeba in the month of Miazia. April 1909, after giving orders to my chiefs in each district that they should carry out their work diligently and that they should guard the country meticulously. <clears throat> Since the Emperor Menelik was gravely ill, he no longer had the strength to undertake any major work except to appear before the army by coming out into the palace square. Consequently, all the people, great and small alike, felt very grieved. As to all the work of government, it was Empress Taitu who took it on as plenipotentiary. For this reason, as peace became disturbed, many people appeared in the palace precinct in devouring to stir up agitation. As all this was going on and while Empress Taitu, acting as plenipotentiary, was carrying out all the work of government, envious men began a conspiracy against her. To deprive her of her powers and to evict her from the palace. When they asked me to join them in the conspiracy, I told them that I did not wish to enter into their plot, and consequently all the, all the conspirators began to look upon me with enmity. When Empress Taitu heard about my refusal to enter into the conspiracy, she told the emperor, and both were very pleased. Although the emperor was gravely ill, at that time his mind was still balanced. Nevertheless, he did not find an appropriate occasion to warn and to reproach the conspirators. As to my refusal to join the conspiracy, I did not tell either the empress or anyone else about it. But those conspirators let out the secret, saying Dejismach Teferi refused when we said to him, Join the conspiracy. When the empress repeatedly asked me in order to find out about this matter with certainty, I was firm in my statement that there was no one who had asked me to join the conspiracy. Therefore, she declared that she was very pleased about my not letting out the secret and told me, I know the truth. Your refusal to let out the secret is because you are a very discreet man. Since Empress Taitu had heard it being reported that it was in the ministerial council chamber that this matter of the conspiracy had been started, she foiled their plot for the time being by causing the ministerial council chamber to be closed. Furthermore, in the previous year, Three Germans had come on government appointments to an advisorship and post in medicine and education and were working while frequently meeting the ministers about their respective tasks. Since Empress Taitu entertained some suspicion that perhaps those Germans might have advised to the minister to conspire against her, it was reported that while seeking some pretext, she made them give up their work. Since in that year, Dechismach Abreha, the governor of Endarta, in the Tigray province had rebelled had rebelled Ras Abata while he was still Wakshum attacked Dej Abraha at the end of Meskerim nineteen o two, October nineteen o nine, and defeated him. It was reported that other governors of the Tigray province were looking on a silence without coming looking on in a silence without coming to the aid of Dej, of Dej Abreha or Ras Abeta. Emperor Menelik's illness was of the type called paralysis, paral paralysis, which prevented him moving all his limbs and carrying out his work. On the 17th of Timket, Tikemt, 1902, 27th October 1909, at 9 o'clock at night, that is to say 3 a.m., it suddenly became impossible for him either to move or to speak, and when the officers and the army heard about this, there was great sadness in the precincts of the palace and in the capital. Yet after a few days, the illness seemed to relax its hold over him, 
and he appeared to be getting better, but it was not thought that he had many years left till death would overtake him. Chapter 4 About my appointment to the governorship of Harar and its province, 1910. After this, Duchess Manchabecha, who was governor of Harar, was summoned to Addis Ababa in the month of Tehasas, December 1909, January 1910. And even before he entered Addis Ababa, it again began to be rumored by the mouth of the people that the emperor was to give the governorship of Harar to Dejasmach Teferri. When Dejasmach Belcha, while still on his way, heard this, he began to make strenuous endeavors immediately on arrival at Addis Ababa to retain the governorship of Harar by means of intercessors as well as money. But I was biding my time, carrying out my other daily duties and thinking that I could not fail to obtain the governorship whenever it might be God's will to show me favor. Later, one day unexpectedly, Ras Bitwadad Tesama, Ras Bitwadad Mengesha Atikam, Fit Aurari Ebta Georges, and Sehafit Ezazge Braselasi Wolde Aragai, while assembled together, summoned me and said, Although you are still a youth in age, but because your entire work in governing Sadamo had shown you to be knowledgeable, the Empress has now given you Haraj, which used to be your father's governorate. I bowed and said, With your help I will take proper care of the government of the province, for I know that a great responsibility rests upon me in being governor of Harar. The proclamation in my favor was issued in the Great Square on the 24th day of Yekatit, 1902. 3rd March 1910, and when I went to my home, the people's joy could be seen to exceed all bounds, as the diplomatic corps who had resident consulates at Harar came to my house informing me of their participation in my joy. They declared, We trust that you will govern Harar in the same fine manner as your father. Until I could go down to my governorate of Harar, I transmitted orders that Fetaurari, later Dejasmach Gebre, who had been my father's loyal follower, should stay there and protect the country as my deputy. While I was preparing for my journey to Harar, it was suddenly reported that Rasbit Wadad Tasama was once again secretly stirring up a plot against Empress Taitu. Although it was Rasbit Wadad Tasama who was the leader of the conspiracy, Dejesman Chikebra Selase, Fitaurari, later Dejesman Chavasene, Dejesman Chiberke, and Dejesmach Marit were those who acted as principal supporters. It was said that Dejesmach, later Ras Damis, who was living there after removal from his governorship, was urging things on secretly rather than openly. A few days after my appointment to the governorship of Harar, all the nobles assembled in the house of the archbishop, Abuna Mateus, and made various seditious charges against Empress Taitu and proffered advice expressing their thoughts as follows. We do not want you to enter upon the affairs of government, but you should henceforth remain in the palace looking after the sick emperor. But Empress Taitu had many partisans and consequently things remained in, in ambience because it caused difficulty to determine the matter. Empress Taitu was strong-willed and an expert in the art of ruling. At that time, I was an admirer of Empress Taitu's regal qualities, since it was with her help that I had been appointed to the governorship of Harar. The nobles did not dare talk to me about it and reveal the matter. After things had remained in ambience, without a decision having been reached, for about 15 days a meeting was called in the house of Etaurari et Agiorges, and all of us were summoned on 11th Megabit, 20th March 1910 and went there. Ras Bitwadit Tesama also came, summoned like the other noblemen, in order to let it appear that he had not entered upon the matter. Afterwards, Fetaurari Ebta Georges, being the spokesman of the meeting, declared, We are not pleased about all the work which Empress Taito is carrying out, and particularly about the appointments and dismissals. Only Dejesmach Teferi's appointment to his father's governorship in Harar is fine and his alone may stand, but the remaining appointments and dismissals are to be cancelled. In future, she is not to interfere 
with us in the business of government. And the speech finished thus. We all say with one voice, let Dejismach Teferri appointment be valid, but it is proper to cancel the other appointments and dismissals. On the morrow, 12th Megabit, 21st March, being all assembled together, they entered the palace, approached Empress Taitu and said, It is our view that the Empress should reside in the palace and look after the sick Emperor on our behalf, but the work of government she should leave to the regent Ras Bitwadit Tesama. When they had finished speaking, Empress Taitu turned her face towards Ras Bitwadit Tesama and said, why do you put the blame on someone else when you know that it is you who has planned and done this whole thing? I have heard everything for certain. What really saddens me is you're operating by stealth. As for government business, when I told you some time ago that I would take care of the ailing emperor and leave affairs of state alone, you sent Ras Mengisha Atikam as an intermedi intermediary arguing while you have been carrying on the business of government without initiating us. So what do we know about it? As for your statement that you will abandon state affairs, this is tantamount to saying, what do I care if things break down? When you said to me, it is by the work you undertake from now on that you can best, slow, you can best show gratitude to Menelik, did I not say to you in reply that I would help in every way possible if I can usefully do any work? And again, what is the work that I have done without consulting you? Come now, tell me frankly and say, this I had not heard and that I had not known. After having spoken thus, she blamed him for three things. One, for his stirring up secretly and conspiracy, the conspiracy. Two, for his sending an int intermediary demanding that she should carry on the work of government that he, three that she had not been doing anything without informing and consulting him after this as Ras Bitwadi Tesama and the other noblemen were ashamed about the matter they bowed and said forgive us but since Empress Taitu was very distressed about it she gave no answer whatever as regards the request for forgiveness except to weep silently Nevertheless, the business of government, in accordance with the decision taken in the house of Etaurari Ebt Agiorgas, was transferred in full into the hands of Ras Bit Bitwadid Tesama and began to be carried out by him. It had appeared to me proper for this reason that I should wait before going down to my governorate of Harar. But when things were settled, I asked Ras Bitwadid Tesama, Tesama's permission to depart, but was told to wait. The reason why I was told to wait was that rumors began to circulate outside to the effect that some monks who claimed to have seen a dream vision told him if Dejasmach Teferi goes down to Harar, it may become very dangerous to the government of Lijiasu. On the fourth day after Ras Bitwadit Tesama had become regent plenipotentiary, he immediately arrested Fetaurari Taye Gulet Gulelate claiming that he was an adversary of Lij Yasu, and consequently there was for a time a good deal of anxiety on my part, but since man cannot avert what God has willed, it was Ras Bitwade Tesama's plan to cause Lij Yasu and me to enter into a covenant and thus to prevent anything from happening that might be an obstacle in his work. Thus he took me and my father's senior officers to the house of the Archbishop, Abuna Matewos, and all of us entered upon the following covenant with oaths and invocations. 1. That I would not seek by trickery or rivalry Lijiasu's throne. 2. That my officers would not give me bad advice to seize Lijiasu's throne. 3. That Lijiasu, looking upon me with eyes of rivalry, would not depose me from my father's governorate of Harar. 4. That Ras Tesama by giving bad and deceitful advice to Lijasu would not dismiss me from the governorship of Harar and would not bring about my destruction on account of my alleged rivalry. Since I was subsequently permitted to go down to Harar, I took leave of the great men of rank to whom it is proper to say goodbye by going to each of their houses. Although it was a very delicate time for taking leave of Empress Taitu, I felt that my conscience 
would reproach me if I went without saying goodbye. Hence, I went to the palace, took my leave, and set out on my journey. At that time, the railway from Addis Ababa to Diredawa had not yet been built, and the journey was extremely tiring for me. We reached Harar towards the end of Miyazia, early May. While well, my deputy at Harar had been awaiting the day of our entry into the city, having prepared a big banquet, it so happened by coincidence that on the day on which I reached Harar, it was reported that the English king, His Majesty Edward VII, had died on 28th Miyazia, 1902, 6th May, 1910. Consequently, we gave orders that the planned reception in our honor be cancelled and that the flag be flown at half-mast. We then informed the English consul at Harar of our participation in the grief, that we felt a special grief was because at the time of King Edward VII's coronation as King of England, the Emperor of India, my father, and the Emperor of India, my father, His Highness Ras Makonen, had gone there as principal envoy of Emperor Menelik and used to tell me at that time of the honor with which he had been received by the English royal house. As my father reached the London for the coronation and heard of the postponement of coronation day on account of King Edward's sudden illness, he went to Westminster Abbey and gave, according to the custom observed in our country Ethiopia, to the church as a votive offering a large golden cross and said, Coming to London and finding the king in great danger, if I were to return to my country with the celebration of the coronation not taking place, I would be considered the, the harbinger of bad luck. Therefore, my God, let your trust, King Edward, recover for my sake. My father had told me about this, and I also knew of the existence there of the cross from a similar encounter. When I came to visit London in 1916, that is, 1924, King George V, having done me the honor of inviting me, the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Canterbury, the RT on Honorable Randall Thomas Davidson, when showing me what Westminster Abbey appointed out to me, pointed out to me this golden cross and said, it is the one which your father, His Highness Rasmaconid, had given as a votive offering for the illness of King Edward. Seven days later, the entire ceremony of festive welcome was happily completed, and we set out on the task of administering the country. What it means to administer a large province can only be appreciated by men who have carried the responsibility of governorship. Even when setting down and writing the affairs of administration, the burdens of the task can scarcely be felt by those who just read about it. It may thus seem a commonplace matter to them. However, I had a heavy and very wearisome burden, which was different from the, that of other provincial governors. The reasons are as follows. 1. In my father's time, the peasants and soldiers had not known another governor, and they lived in concord, recognizing him alone as master and as father. But since my father's death, because of the guber, gubernatorial tenure of Dejesmach Yelma and Dejesmach Belcha, this state of affairs had changed, and it now fell to me to devise a method by which it was possible to govern by reconciling peasants and soldiers and to please them as in my father's time. 2. Since my brother Dejas Manchielma had died shortly after his appointment to Harar and Dejas Manchibelcha had been appointed governor in succession, 3,000 of my father's arm, army were given to me. These 3,000 had subsequently gone to Walega, nominally as Ligiasu's army. Now, therefore, as they were once again returning to me, I had to reestablish quarters for them. 3. There were many of Dejesmach Yelmas and Dejesmach Belcha's servants who had remained in Harar because they wanted to stay with me, and I now had to give quarters to them as well. 4. As I informed myself of the Klobukowski Accord into which Emperor Menelik had entered with the French government in 1900, that is to say 1907-1908, concerning all matters dealing with the relations with foreigners, I had to operate the yoke of this treaty with which Ethiopia had been burdened. 
the great among the noblemen, soldiers, and peasants in each district had assembled and come to participate in my joy at my appointment to the governorship of Harar. We told them that in future we would inform them of everything we were going to do about the administration of the country, and then we dismissed them. We were resolved to set out on the task of administering the province. At that time, we became convinced that the administrative regulations were at present unwelcome to the army. Nevertheless, these regulations will undoubtedly become familiar in the course of time, and so we carried on with our ideas, conscious that it was necessary to do what is to the benefit of good government, while we were seeking to find all the records with which the governors preceding me had been working, thinking that they would assist us in the task, it turned out to be impossible to find them in full, and only a few of the records of my father, His Highness Ras Makonen, and of my brother, Dejesvanch Yelma, were in fact discovered. It therefore became necessary for us to make inquiries and to ask the elders among the noblemen and peasants who had for long been living in Harar. Moreover, the problem of accommodation of the army officers and men had become very troublesome for us, the officers', the officers quarters being in one district while the men's were in another. They met only during military expeditions, but did not always know each other either by sight or in the chain of command. We were convinced that unless officers and men lived together in one district, uprooting them from their peasant quarter, present quarters, and got accustomed to each other by sight and command, it would be very damaging to good discipline for them to meet at the time of military operations only. Consequently, it was necessary for us to know, first of all, the number of the troops and the extent of their quarters. In order to enable us to make proper provisions, we therefore gave orders that men should tour the districts of Harar province counting the peasants able to pay taxes and provide this information speedily by going to each district. When the men who had been ordered to count these peasants returned after completing their work within three months, they presented us with written records showing that there were 70,000 inhabitants able to pay taxes. After this, we arranged for the governorate of Harar to be divided into 12 large districts as follows. Chikarchar Kori, Wabra, Miata, Anya, surroundings of Harar, Garamulata, Afrank Alo, Jarso, Chechika, Ogadan Issa, and Gorgora. Over these large districts, we appointed several principals, principal chiefs and arranged that in each district officers and men according to their ranks would be properly organized. Landowners, soldiers, and officers had their names entered in the register, and it was arranged that officers and men should stay together instead of being separated from each other, so that they would be found together at a time when they were called up for any reason. It was also arranged to have courts of justice set up in each district to be responsible for each administrative division. Only as far as the administration of the church is concerned was the time not granted to us to complete matters according to our plan, and for the time being we left it as of old. After my father, His Highness Ras Makonen, had died, much of the governmental framework which he had established had been destroyed on account of the frequent change of governors of Harar. I therefore felt sure in my heart that the yoke of government was heavy upon the inhabitants for the provincial governors. Abegaz, the district of chiefs Damina, and the local headman Garada did not protect the population with impartiality. Consequently, we began to seek an improvement of the situation. The Abegaz is in effect the provincial regent. The Damina stands between the people in the district and the tax collector so that the inhabitants pay their taxes on time. He functions as a controller lest the tax collector should harm the people either by taxes or in other ways. Some Daminas have charge of perhaps from 20 to 300 peasants. The Garada is a chief who issues orders and acts under the authority of the Damina. This system is the one which has remained in force up to now. 
it having become customary at the time when the Turks, i.e. Egyptians, had seized Harar for a short time for about 10 years after my father's death when the administrative framework which he had established was progressively disintegrating, some tax collectors were receiving up to $12 in cash when it was difficult for the peasants to produce the honey tax payable on his land. We therefore commanded the governors and tax collectors not to harm the peasants by their rule, for they had begun to do other similar things which were harmful to the inhabitants. But unless the people heard of this command in form of a proclamation, we were convinced that they were not able to dispute impositions of this sort by refusing to pay, and we therefore promulgated the following proclamation. Proclamation. You who are Abigas, look out for thieves and brigands in the country, which you govern as deputy. Which you govern as deputy. If I hear it being said that in a certain province people have been robbed, it is the Abigas who will pay them. You who have no master and are unemployed, enter the town which I have given to the Abigas and stay there. But do not disturb the peasants by being in the villages. If the roads in your respective gov governorates fall into despair, build roads in order not to make things difficult for the traders going up and down the country. Hitherto work on the, on the Shabbat was forbidden. Now, now you will, in fact, be punished when found working on the Sabbath, on the Shabbat. As for you who are liable to honey tax and possess honey, I have indicated to your abigas the proper measure hence render your honey in that measure but if you do not have honey then give in lieu of the honey four dollars if you are a garda three dollars as a shebata two as a tenant and one as a shepherd if however you possess honey and say i would rather give cash then you have to pay double the quantity of honey if you are found selling your honey you, being a Garada, paying the same amount of tax as a Shebata, spend three dollars like a Shebata for your honey. Garada, Shebata, tenant and shepherd, except if it is difficult for you, your tax money, your tax is honey. Hence hang up your beehives and you, Melkana, district collector, do not touch the honey before it is ready. In future, as in the past, work with your Damina in all the work that is to be done. Previously I told you by province, yet you have not acquired a new country. Hence do not eat up the Kobe Basa. Now I have heard it being said that you are receiving in it from the peasants. Therefore return to the peasants this money which you have received beyond the terms of this proclamation. And for the future, you, the Abigas and Damina, Watch lest the Melkana district collector, going beyond what has been assigned to them, take away the peasants' money. If the peasants tell you about the money which has been extorted in excess, and if you persist in not returning it to them, and if, and if then the peasants do not work and come to me to complain, then the loss is yours and you will have to pay the money, and will then have to get it back from the person who had taken it from the peasants. And as for you, peasants, do not come to me before you have spoken to the Abigas and the Damina. For the three annual festivals, i.e. for Meskel, Christmas, and Easter, receive two dollars each in lieu of castrated goats, but beyond this you will not receive anything. Harar, 13th Hamlet, 1905, 21st July, 1913. When the proclamation had been issued, although the Abigas and district collectors were for a time not at all pleased, after a few months they got used to the new administrative rules and discovered their usefulness. As for the peasants, since the yoke of government and taxes was lightened for them, they all set out to do their work with a calm heart. Tuesday, May 30th, 2017. Chapter 5. From the time of my marriage up to my appointment as Crown Prince and Regent Plenipotentiary, 1911-1916. When I had been Governor of Harar and its entire province for about a year, stabilizing without mishap the life of peasants and soldiers, of government and of all else necessary for administration, 
It was decided by my wish and by that of my relations that I should marry. I was in my twentieth year at that time. Wyzero Menen, now Empress, the granddaughter of Negus Mikael. We were married by church ceremony on 23rd Hamle, 1903, that is to say 31st July, 1911. Her character is such that, apart from goodness, there is no evil or malice in her. Ever since we were married, we lived together by virtue of her being fertile in, in one family, sharing joy as well as sadness. In, staying, in saying that we lived together sharing joy as well as sadness, I cannot omit writing about the first great sadness as follows. We were informed at Harar of the death in 1907, that is to say 1914-1915, of Ras Haila Mariam, Waizero Menin's younger brother. When their mother, Waizero Sehin, returned from Wayo to Addis Ababa, it was decided that because of her brother's death, Waizero Menin should go up to Addis Ababa for the joint mourning, and consequently she set out from Harar on Monday, 30th Genbot, 7th June 1915. Having accompanied her as far as Hiramaya, we camped by the shore of Lake Hiramaya as we, i.e. Dej Teferi, wished to return to Harar. In the past, there was a boat in which the foreigners living at Harar and Tiredawa used sometimes to enter Lake Hiramaya for recreation. We therefore left the, t the tent at 9 o'clock, that is to say 3 p.m., and went to the lake. There were 10 people who boarded the boat with us to relax on the lake. After we had embarked, we passed towards the center and eventually crossed to the other side. Having stayed a little while on the opposite shore, we entered the boat once again to return to our camp. But the boat was rather old and, as we reached the middle of the lake, it was hold and water began to enter. As the people in the boat scooped out the water with their hats, it did not diminish when they poured it out. Once we had become convinced of the fact that the boat was leaking, that it was impossible to cross with us inside it, and that we were all of us sinking with the boat, we began to swim with great difficulty. But as the lake was wide and it was impossible to cross it by swimming, the following seven men became exhausted and drowned. Abatesfa Egnazmach Gebrewode at Oyala Seyum, Kidana Mariam Mayazawal, Asamre, Abba Samuel, Paulus. But I and Dejismach Hayala Selassie were going under and coming up again. Dejismach Abreha's servant helped me, as the officers and men who were watching this standing by the shore of the lake became convinced of the shipwreck. All those able to swim threw themselves into the lake and as they reached us we emerged having only just escaped from death as we go as we got out our soul had barely been prevented from getting separated from our body but we were unable to recognize anyone or to speak it so happened that by chance dr zervos a greek who had earlier been a physician was there at the time and he treated me with medicines as far as possible and little by little I was able to recognize people's outline. On the morrow, they carried me on a stretcher to Amaresa, and from Amaresa took me down to Harar. And on the twelfth day, being quite well again, I went up to the church of St. Michael and gave thanks to God. Waizero Menen, being shocked on account of my accident, abandoned her journey to Addis Ababa and returned to Harar. Footnote. The incident is described in somewhat different versions. In Sanford, 36 and mostly 80. Of the people who died, only Abba Samuel is known to me. He was, of course, the emperor's tutor and close friend. His death was a great shock to him. Chapter 6. The reason why rancor between Lich Yasu and myself began. After my appointment to the governorship of Harar and my marriage to Waizero Menen, I lived happily for about a year. But thereafter, since in this world, joy and sadness always alternate, my joy began progressively to change into sadness. The reason for this is as follows. After the death of Raspit Wadid Tesama, who had been Lij Yasu's guardian and regent of the empire, no other guardian had been appointed for Lij Yasu. But the latter, 
than thus sought in everything the company and counsel of worthless men who only wanted their own immediate profit, while the great nobles and ministers became hostile and removed their hearts from him. Those worthless men whom he had made advisers associated with some foreign traders and said, We are importing from abroad commodities like this. We are sending abroad goods like that. Hence, excuse us customs duties. Very few only were those who sought the truth and advised him as follows. Quite apart from obtaining permits by fraud, if they do this, your government will be harmed. If they do that, your government will profit. If they do this rotten thing, the people will be hostile. Furthermore, when he claimed by virtue of his wallow descent to be descended from the prophet Mohammed, counting back some forty generations, and when he worked for a meeting and reproachment in faith with the Muslims, he would not accept it if anyone tried to advise, lay off, for it is this sort of thing that will bring damage upon your government and upon yourself. He began to arrange for the palace arms and all the other excellent equipment to go to Negus Mikael. While in doing all this, he was aware of everybody's hostility, and instead of watching things by being in one place, he did a great deal of roaming about, joyfully invading tranquil provinces and killing people, some time going to Gimera, another to Wallo, yet another to Adal country, and sometimes to Harar. The blood of many was flowing. When he returned from his trips, the nobles and ministers, tendering advice and getting angry, all despaired when they realized their inability to restore his mind to sanity. There were, however, some who advised him as follows. If the honor of the great nobles of Menelik's time were reduced and their rank diminished, then it would be convenient for you to raise to office the humble. It would assuredly result from this that these minor figures will respectfully love you alone, and with their support you will be able to act as you wish and to destroy your enemies. As this appeared to him to be true, he began to strive to bring this about. He himself came upon me at Harar in 1907, that is to say 1914-1915, summoned my army's officers and the great among the peasants, and asked at a secret, at a secret meeting, Tell me if there is a wrong that Dejasmach Tevri has done you. He then granted audiences while giving advice to my detriment, st stayed for a few days, and then returned. I, had this, I heard this from men who had actually been questioned. Afterwards, in Gembot, May 1916, he summoned me to Addis Ababa, and when we had remained together for about two months, he set out from Addis Ababa by night on 21st Hamli, 29th July, without informing me, boarded the train at Akaki, and next morning I heard about his descent to Harar. When I knew for certain that he had gone down to Harar, and although he went there without informing me, I thought it should not appear that I was hostile to his journey there because he had not given me prior information, for the title of, to the Harar governorship was mine, and I therefore wrote him a letter as follows. If you are staying at Harar, let me come there. If you are returning to Addis Abeba, I shall return together with you. When I had sent him that letter by the hand of my servant, Zalekta Kelala, he wrote back to me on the 28th Hamle, 1908, 5th August, 1916, as follows. I had told Bidwadid Alegorges that he should inform you of the reason why I came to Harar. If you were to come to Harar now and then to return with me to Addis Ababa, the railway deficit would be very great for you. Because your army is so numerous, hence stay there. If I were to stay here for a long time, I would write to you again. When he entered Harar city, evil men who came between us and tendered advice that he should dismiss that Jesmach Teferi from the governorship of Harar and appoint himself, began to press him to put into practice the counsel they had earlier preferred, for now they had Lijiasu to themselves. Therefore, on the 7th Nahasi, 1908, 14th August, 1916, he summoned my deputy, Fetaurati Gebre, and gave orders that all the camping places in the hands of Dejasmach Teferi's servants be seized, apart from those occupied by government troops. He then transmitted the following orders by telegram to Betoadit Haile Gyrgis. I have assumed with immediate effect the governorship of Harar. I have given the governorship of Kafa to Dejasmach Teferi. Let him 
be told. He informed me that I was to go to Kaffa at once, as these were Lejiasu's orders. Subsequently, he, Lejiasu, sent me a letter direct written on the 10th, 10th of Nahase, 1908, 17th August, 1916, stating, I have appointed Harar my own personal governorate. I have placed under your governorship Kaffa and Maje, and under your authority Gurafarte. When the people at Addis Ababa, great and small, heard this, they declared openly the fact that he, Lejasu, is taking away the governorship of Harar from Dejasmach to Ferri is not so much for the governorate, but because he has been converted to the Islamic faith and for the sake of the further reproachment to the Muslims. At the time of the Great World War, when some foreigners presented to him Lejasu their view, even though you cannot help the English, the French, and the Italians, who are Ethiopia's neighbors at the frontiers, with armed force, it would be good if you would at least assist with provisions, i.e. with food. Yet he did not listen. Instead, he had begun on an exchange of secret correspondence with the people surrounding Ethiopia, the Adelites and the Somalis, with a view to, to resisting the Allies, but as the representatives of the three governments resident at Addis Ababa had discovered this exchange of secret letters, they made an official approach and, it is reported, presented the correspondence to Bitwadid Haile Georges. When the leaders of Ethiopia found out about this whole affair, they became convinced of the need to depose Lijiasu, but as it appeared to them likely that their secret would be betrayed if they were assembled together for consultation, they, cl they chose servants as trusted messengers and began to correspond through them as go-betweens. But some met by night at a hidden place and, after taking to each other face to face, separated again. Others again were asking, inform us first about the successor once Lijiasu is deposed. But the party which approved of Lijiasu's deposition began to grow steadily, since they gladly accepted the opinion when they were told, We shall put Emperor Menelik's daughter, Wazero Zauditu, on the throne and shall appoint His Highness Ras Makonin's son, Dejesmach Teferi, as Crown Prince and Regent. When they asked me to enter upon these consultations, I replied, When I first departed from my father's governorate of Haraj to take up my appointment, Ras Bitwa de Tesama took us both, Lijiasu and myself, to the house of the Archbishop Abuna Matewos and caused us to enter upon a covenant by oath and invocations that Lijiasu should not depose me from my governorship of Haraj and that I should not seek his throne by foul means. But now Lijiasu has violated the solemn covenant of oaths and invocations, has dismissed me from my governorship of Haraj, and for my part this is sufficient evidence. Furthermore, I said to them, since you have now convinced me of Lijiasu's conversion to Islam, there is nothing in which I differ from you and they gave me adequate information by reading out everything they had written so that it be proof to the people for the future. Chapter 7 From the Disposition of Lejiasu on 17th Meskaram 1909, 27 September 1916 to the Assumption of the Crown by Queen Zauditu on 4th Yekatit 1909, 11th February 1917 While Lejiasu went to and fro between the towns of Deradawa, Harar, and Jajaga, and while he assembled Adelites and Somalis, giving them medals and arms, he stayed there declaring, I am on your side in respect of religion. It was then heard that the Muslims were mocking. He is neither Christian nor Muslim. On the 17th day of Meskerem 1909, 27th September 1916, on the day of the great feast of Meskel, it was arranged that the nobles with the army and the Archbishop Abuna Mateos and the Itzchage de Georges with the priest should assemble at a prepared place within the precincts of the palace. And when they had all arrived and taken their seat according to their rank, the following indictment against Lijiasu, which had been secretly prepared, was read out. The Christian faith with our fathers, which our fathers had hitherto carefully retained by fighting for their faith with the Muslims and by shedding their blood, Lijiasu exchanged for the Muslim religion and aroused commotion in our midst. In order to exterminate us by mutual fighting, he has converted to Islam, and therefore he, we shall henceforth not submit to him. We shall not place a Muslim king 
on the throne of a Christian king. We have ample proof of his conversion to Islam. 1. He married four wives claiming the Quran permits it to me. Of these wives, one is the daughter of Abba Jafar of the Jema nobility. The second is the daughter of Hajj Abdullahi of the, of the Harar nobility. The third is the daughter of Abu Bakr of the Adal nobility. The father of the fourth, Dejaj Dejote, became a Christian and baptized his daughter. While she lived under her baptismal name, Askale Mariam, it was to, to Dejaj Dejote's daughter that he, Lijiaso, later on, after his conversion to Islam, gave the Muslim woman's name of Momina. 2. He built a mosque at Jijiga with government funds and gave it to the Muslims. 3. At that time, he sent to Mahazar Bey, the foreign Turkish consul resident at Addis Abeba, as he was celebrating the Ramadan feast. Our Ethiopian flag, on which there was written, the Lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed, and adorned with the sign of the cross, on which he had caused to be written the following words in Arabic, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. 4. He wore Somali Muslim clothes, and the Muslim turban held the Islamic rosary, and was seen to prostrate himself in the mosque. 5. He was seen praying and reading the Quran, having had it transcribed in Amharic characters. 6. On the headgear of his special guards, he had embroidered the legend, There is no God but Allah. 7. His Highness Ras Makonen had built a church at Harar and had made the area adjoining the church into a dwelling for the clergy, giving the Muslims a place in exchange. Then, 32 years later, he, Lijiyasu, expelled the clergy and restored it to the Muslims. 8. When a girl was born to him, he saw to it that she would grow up learning the Muslim religion, and he gave her to the Muslim Madame Hanafi and said, bringing her up on my behalf. 9. He despised the descent of Menelik II, which comes direct from Menelik I, and claimed to be descended from the Prophet Muhammad. Assembling the great Muslim Shiites, he spent the day convincing them of his genealogical calculations. 10. The day on which our great king Emperor Menelik, who had bequitted him the throne, died instead of mourning and of arrange, arranging lamentations he went out horse riding to Janmeda and spent the day playing combat games he forbade Menelik's body to be buried with dignity and thus it has remained up to now we possess a great deal of further similar proof against Lijiasu therefore having deposed him Lijiasu we have we have placed on the throne Waizero Zauditu, Emperor Menelik's daughter. We have appointed Dejismach Teferi, the son of His Highness Ras Makonen, Crown Prince with the rank of Ras and Regent of the Empire. When the reading of this proclamation was concluded, all those assembled said with one voice, We accept gladly, hence let it be carried out with success. The Archbishop Abuna Mateus and the Itchage Wolde Georges spoke the following final words. Lijiasu has repudiated the Christian religion and, because he has been converted to the Islamic faith, we have excommunicated him. You will be excommunicated if henceforth you follow Lijiasu and submit to him. Instead of leaving strong, living strong in the Orthodox faith and watchful of the freedom of your government. Afterwards, the proclamation was issued by which the throne and the crown went to Queen Zauditu, while the succession to the throne and the regency plenipotentiary went to me. The text of the proclamation was then transmitted by telephone to the princes and nobles and all the provincial gover governors in the whole of Ethiopia. As it was about 40 years since Negus Mikael had been converted from Islam to Christianity, he had been mentioning to some of the nobles his sadness at his son's conversion to Islam. Consequently, the text of the proclamation was transmitted to him in the thought that he was bound to be allied with us now as regards his son's deposition. When Lijiasu, staying at Harar, heard about his own deposition, the enthronement of Queen Zauditu, and my appointment to, as Crown Prince and Regent Plenipotentiary, he collected Somalis 
and Adalites and arranged for disturbances to be created in the city. As Christians and Muslims were now fighting on separate sides, some 500 men from both sides died, as Dejismach Belcha and Kanazmach, now Ras Emru, were at the time at Harar, they were seized, but Lij Yasa released Dejismach Belcha under oath that he would not get separated from him. Kanazmach Emru, however, he kept under detention. All my officers and servants, with few exceptions, who were at Harar, deserted Lij Yasu, departed for a district called Arsa and began to wait there in proper battle formation. Agnasmanch Emru escaped from the place at which he had been detained and went out. This is what happened to Lijiasu subsequently. Having collected a regular body of troops, he appointed Dejismach Guksa Alyo as an army commander, since it was reported that Lijiasu had dispatched him to Awash. He we made a Dejismach Ayalu Beru army commander and sent Dejaj Haila Mariam Lama, Dejaj Admasu Beru, Lij Abeba Damteu, Lij Desta Damteu, Fetarari, Mikuria, Germame, and added other regular troops. They encountered each other at a railway station called Meeso, and on the 25th of Meskarem, 6th October, they defeated Dejismach Gufsa Alio. He himself, however, escaped by train and entered Deradawa. When Lijiasu saw that the Christians at Harar and its entire province, as well as the Muslims, were deserting him, he went down to Deradawa and seized about all he could of the money in the treasury. What he could not take, he sent to Djibouti by the hands of M. Yedlebi, and then traveled by way of the Adal Desert to reach his father's governorate at Walo. But a telephone message had been transmitted to Negus Mikael to the effect, As your son has gone over to Islam, we have deposed him, have enthroned Queen Zauditu, and have appointed His Highness Tafara Makonin, Crown Prince and Regent Plenipotentiary. When Negus Mikael realized this, he said, I had been striving to make my son firm in the Christian faith, even to the point of angrily counseling him. But nevertheless, I cannot silently look on while they take away from him the throne which his grandfather, Emperor Menelik, had given him. It was reported then that, that Negus Mikael had mobilized his army by proclamation and was marching towards Shoah. Therefore, the princes, nobles, and ministers jointly sent him the following message in writing. May it reach Negus Mikael, whose authority is written upon his shoulder, King of Zion. You, the king... Know that all the work which your son Lijiasu has accomplished from the time he became crown prince up to the present was childish behavior. When we meant to train with him with reproachful counsel, we did not find the occasion because to our charge in, we never he never stayed long enough in one place. When at times we managed to find him and tendered advice, he would not accept our view. When we watched him patiently, lest his personality should feel offended, thinking that perhaps one day, soon he would become aware of his government's need and of his own rank and honor and perhaps abandon his youthful pursuits, yet he had still not had enough of these perilia and began striving to establish Islam in our country Ethiopia, which had lived steadfast in her Christianity for some 1600 years since Abraha in Asbeha and Selama, the revealer of the light. When in the previous year he came to Walo, you, O king, know yourself all the things he did together with the Muslims during the rainy season. Again, we have heard of your angry counsel to Lijiasu. When you recognized that his heart had been alienated from the Christian faith and said to him, I beg you, my son, abandon this plan of yours. Yet even you, O king, did not prevail. And now we are sending you, together with this letter, photographs of him which prove all the things he has been doing jointly with the Muslims when he went down to Harar secretly without informing us. We had suffered all this patiently, but when all of us together, including the archbishop and the Et Chage, sent him a letter requesting him to come to Addis Abeba at any rate for the New Year celebrations, he persisted in not coming. Our anxiety in acting in this manner arises from the thought 
lest the Christian faith be extinguished and, for this reason, the blood of Christians be shed in vain and our country pass into the hands of foreigners. May the king thus be very mindful of this matter. It is known that the people would not have risen up unless they had been certain of this. Moreover, we would remind you of the extinction of your name as well, for it is bound to remain recorded in history for future generations. Because of Lij Yasu, Negus Mikael's son, the Christian religion was eclipsed in Ethiopia, and the Islamic faith expanded. In writing all this to the king, it is not that we have acted thus with the intention that Lij Yasu be harmed, or in particular, that the king be antagonized, but it is with the thought that we should act jointly for for what is of benefit to our religion and to our government. Your plans do not diverge from ours, for we know that you love Emperor Menelik and all of us and are much concerned for the Christian faith, 24th Meskerem 1909, 5th October 1916. After this letter had reached Negus Mikael, he refused to return in any circumstances, and as our envoys informed us by telephone of his marching forward, we placed the army that was stationed at Addis Ababa at that time under the command of Ras Lul Segat and sent him on in advance. When he reached a showing district called Toramesk, he suddenly incur encountered Negus Mikael's advanced troops, and on Tuesday, 17th Tekemp, 17th October 1916, we heard by telephone of the of the death in battle of Raslul Segad, the judge Tesama Gazmu, Lika Makwas Abeba Atnaf Seged, Fet Aurari Zaude Gobane, Asalefi Abe, Adnasmach del Nasahu, As Alafi del Nase. Ato Shaweye and other army commanders. Already earlier, on, on our war minister, Fetarari Ebt Agiorges had left Addis Abeba on the 13th, and 13th October, and when he reached Koramesh after a long march, we arranged that he should stay there distributing to each soldier arms from the war material at Koremesh, and we ourselves set out on 9th Tekemt. 19 October, so that the armed forces from each district should arrive by, by as rapid a march as possible. We informed the army by the following proclamation. The text of the proclamation. Listen, people of my country, Ethiopia, since Lij Yasu, digressing from Emperor Menelik's wishes, had openly shown his adherence to Islam, prostrating himself in mosques together with Muslims and tracing back his Islamic genealogy while setting aside Menelik's curse against him designed to prevent him committing evil deeds he was unable to carry on the administration and we therefore had to depose him and place Queen Zauditu on her father's throne while we were thinking that Negus Mikael was aware of his son's conversion to Islam and that together with us he would be shedding his blood for the Christian faith he came marching from Wallow to fight us and insisting that we should at once submit to a Muslim king. Therefore, those of you who are men, follow me. After we had issued this proclamation, we marched forward. But since bloodshed among Ethiopians themselves is extremely saddening, I arranged that monks and priors from the monasteries of Debra Libanus and Zakale and from all the various churches should be selected and come with their crosses to request Negus Mikael to go back to Walla without making war. But word reached us by, the, by telephone that Negus Mikael, far from going back, had in fact seized and arrested the monks who had been sent to bring about peace. We thus became convinced that his decision to engage in battle was now plain and generally known. On 15th Ekemt, 25th October, we set out from Koremash and marched on. On 16th Tekemt, 26th October, our camp and that of Negus Mikael spent the night opposite each other at a plain of the Terra district called Segele. On Friday, 17th Tekemt, 27th October, starting at 7 o'clock at night, that is to say 1 a.m., he, Negus Mikael, stationed his army officers on the right and left flanks and positioned himself in the center and when the morning dawned 
he began opening fire and launched a surprise attack against our gunners who had been spending the night on guard duty. Thereupon, we placed our war minister, Fitzaurari Ibt Agiorgis, at the front, Rascasa at Negus Mikael's rear, and the remaining Rases and Dejismanches on the right and left flanks. When we had joined the entire army at the rear, we engaged the enemy in battle. When we had fought from early morning for about five hours, and when the Shoan army, leaping like a leopard, seeing a goat, like a lion, seeing a cow, entered in battle formation, swords drawn and fighting hand to hand, Negus Mikael was defeated and captured. Of his army, many died and many were captured, while those who remained, remained fled and returned to Wallo. When Li Jiasu, having to travel by way of the Adal country and marching fast to reach the battle, arrived at Ankober, he heard of Negus Mikael's defeat. He retraced his steps and got to the Wallo region by the Adal detour. Although it was generally known that Negus Mikael had been captured, this was a formality only. In fact, we arranged everything befitting his dignity so that no humiliation whatever should affect him. As for the other prisoners, since we have no other quarrel with Wallo and mindful of the fact that we are all natives of one Ethiopia, we allowed them by proclamation to go back to their country of Wallo after their release. As we announced the story of the victory to Addis Ababa by telephone, all the people of the capital, from Queen Zauditu downwards, were overjoyed. When we got back to Addis Ababa on Thursday, 23rd, 2nd November, Her Majesty Queen Zauditu seated in a vast tent at Jan Meda, and the people of the capital being assembled in full, received us with a great parade, with ululating and with joy. Chapter 8 From the coronation of Queen Zauditu up to Ligiasu's defeat at Wallo and subsequent escape. Since it had been resolved in council that Queen Zauditu's coronation should take place on 4th Yekatit 1909, 11th February 1917, we began passing on instructions to all chiefs that everything necessary for the celebration of the coronation be prepared. There were invited to come to Addis Ababa for the coronation the governor of Begameter and Shemian, Raswell de Georges, the governor of Selale, Borana and Dara, Ras Casa, the governor of Gojam, Ras Hailu, the governor of Tigre, Raseyum, and other governors of the large provinces. The political atmosphere at that time was grave for invitations of this kind. Respectful invitations to come to the coronation were sent to the governors of foreign countries Coder Minis with Ethiopia, i.e. the governors of the British Sudan and of British Somaliland as well as the governor of French Somaliland. When all those invited had arrived on Sunday the 4th of Yekatit, 11th February 1917, in the great cathedral, the Church of St. George, Queen Zauditu was anointed with the oil of kingship at the hands of the Archbishop the Abuna Mateos and wore the imperial crown. After this, according to the law, of the ordinances of kingship, it was once more proclaimed in front of those assembled within the precincts of the church that Queen Zauditu, sitting on her father's throne, was assuming her reign and I was becoming crown prince and regent plenipotentiary. Eight days later, on 11th Yekatit, 18th February, Raswell de Georges was crowned by Queen Zauditu and proclaimed Negus of Gandhar. For the sake of his kingship, authority over the Tigray province was added for his enhancement. In making once again proper balances and adjustments for provincial appointments and demotions, we gave to Raswale his erstwhile governorate of Yaju, to his son Rasguksa Wale, the Sayant region, and to Ras Abeta, the seven tribes of Walo, Negus Mikael's former governorate. When Lij Yasu heard of the appointments and dismissals that had been made, he hurried down from Megdala and marched to Yaju. As the news reached us that he had clashed with Ras Wallace's younger son, Dejismach Amede, defeating and capturing him, it became clear to us that hem henceforth there could be no peace or security unless Lij Yasu were seized. 
We therefore arranged for a large army under the command of our war minister, Fetaurari et Agiorgis, to proceed to Wallo, to search strenuously for Ligiasu and to capture him. When Fetaurari et Agiorgis reached Wallo, he heard that Ligiasu was collecting an army while roaming the country here and there. He then took the city of Desi and began waiting for Ligiasu there. The principal commanders with Fetaurari et Agiorgis were Ras Abeta and Ras Casa, and with them were Dejismach Kabeda, Tesama, and Dejismach Hailamariam, Lama, and well as Dejismach Makuria, Garmame, and other military commanders. After Lij Yasu had collected a sizable army, he appointed his father's army commanders, i.e., Ras Yamar, as commander in chief, and Fetaurari Serach Bezu as deputy commander. On 21st Nahase 1909, 27th August 1917, early in the morning, he launched an attack joined battle, and, and fierce fighting took place. Fetaurari et Agiorgis, without leaving his walled emplacement, resisted vigorously and emerged victorious, while Ras Yemar was captured, but Fetaurari Serag Bezu died in the battle. When Lejiyasu heard of the capture of Ras Yemar and of the death of Zera Bezu, he escaped galloping off on his horse, quite alone, and made for the countryside. The news of the victory was transmitted by wire the same day, and there was great rejoicing at Addis Ababa. But since in this world joy and sadness are mixed, Ras Abeta, who had been ill for some time, rose on the day of the battle, refusing to stay in bed in his tent, and spent the day fighting. As a consequence, his illness became worse. And on the 6th Tech 1910, 16th October 1917, he died. When the death announcement reached us, there was great mourning. We arranged for his body to be taken to Debra Libanos, went down there ourselves and had him buried with high honors. As a memorial, we caused his sword to be buried with his body. Chapter 9. About the dismissal of ministers and the outbreak of an influenza epidemic. About ten years had elapsed since ministers were first appointed in any event since the people as a whole were very incensed about the minister's negligence to carry on equitably the business of government and about the gradual deterioration of every aspect of the work. They rose up in league with each other and indicated that the ministers should be changed for the good of the people. But as it had not hitherto been customary for the authority of the people to intervene in the appointment and dismissal of ministers, we argued on their behalf to the best of our ability by refusing to dismiss them. In thinking to calm matters, we arranged for the ministers to depart for the time being. Until new ministers could be selected and appointed, the entire work had to be carried out on our responsibility alone, and this caused great fatigue to us. After this, from the first Hedar, to the 30th, 10th November, to the 9th December. There broke out at Addis Ababa and in all the other provinces of Ethiopia an influenza epidemic, and in the city of Addis Ababa alone more than 10,000 people died. But I, after I had fallen gravely ill, was spared from death by God's goodness. The great war that had raged in Europe came to an end in this year, and the Germans and the Turks were defeated by France, England, Italy, and by the other allied governments. Lich Yasu had not at that time permitted us to help even by supplying provisions to our neighbors, and although we had stood apart, the victors were our neighbors, and we, therefore, decided to send envoys to them to congratulate them, adding some money for the aid of the wounded. The following were selected for this task. To the French government, Dejismach Paul de Gabriel Bechach as principal, and included in his delegation were Dejismach Shebashe Beyan and Negatres Zauga. To England and the United States, Dejismach Nedel as principal, and included in his delegation were Ato Heroi Boldeslasi and Kanteba Gabru. To the Italian government, Dejismach Getacho. Abita as principal and included in his delegation were Fetaurari Mengesha Webe and Azaj Dagafe. They departed from Addis Ababa in April, May, April to May 1919. 
and returned when they had concluded the business for which they had been sent. Chapter 10 About Lijasu's Arrest in Tigre Lijasu, having fought at Desi with our war minister, Fitarari et Agiorgis, and having been defeated, had escaped into the Ausa desert. When he had stayed there for about two years, wandering to and fro, he emerged from the desert and was rumored to have gone to a place called Kepsia. The governor of Tigre, Rasiyum, had for a time tried to make peace with him, Lejiasu, but as it was extremely difficult to say, give up the notion of kingship and crown and let someone else take them, he abandoned reconciliation and made him leave his governorate. Thereupon he went away from Rasiyum's domain and entered that of Ras Guxa Araya. When we heard of this, we transmitted orders to Ras Guxa that he should search for him and capture him. Ras Guxa indicated as follows, I wish to undertake the search, but as Lijiasu had secret conversations with Rasiyum, I am afraid the latter might come and snatch him away. Therefore, let some men come to me as his guards. We therefore sent to Tigre for the arrest of Lijiasu. Lij, later Ras, Desta Demtau as internal, personal guard, and Dejismach Getachu and Dejismach Hailas Lasse, Fitaurari Wake, Dejach Wasane Terfe, and Dejach Weldeslasse, so that they should act together with Ras Guxa as external guards. We were at Desi, having traveled there, departing from Addis Ababa on the Thursday after Easter, 27th Miyazia, 1913, that is to say 5th May, 1921. In order to listen on all sides, the governor of Gojam, Ras Hailu, was summoned and we met as he entered. And we met as he entered Desi in battle order. When Ras Guxa informed us of the arrest of Lijasu after a successful search, we ordered him to come to Desi at once with the captive, and he brought him along and handed him over. Rasiyum was also summoned, and we took away from him the governorship of Adwa as a punishment, punishment for sending off Lijasu without arresting him, and gave the governorship to Dejismach Gebreselasi. To Ras Guxa, we gave an additional governorship on top of his previous one for capturing and bringing in Lij Yasu. We made a number of adjustments in promotions and demotions and gave leave to Ras Hailu to return to Gojam. We went back to Addis Ababa and got there on 12th Hamle, 19th July, 1921. We dispatched Lij Yasu to Salale to fetch and arranged that he should reside there guarded by our faithful Ras Casa. As Lejiasu had remained at liberty for about four years since his deposition in 1909-1916, some, some idlers had not ceased causing trouble. But following Lejiasu's arrest, there had been great benefit to the country in the progressive spread of peace and security. Chapter 11 About Men Who Were an Obstacle to the Work of Government by coming between Queen Zauditu and myself. There had existed between Queen Zauditu and my father, His Highness Ras Makonen, a friendship of mutual confidence and consideration over and above their relationship, and seeing me with my father's eye, she showed me she showed for me almost a mother's regard. Moreover, Lijiasu had done us some sort of injustice intending to sadden and to offend both of us. He had forcibly evicted Queen Zauditu lest she should dwell in her father's capital, Addis Ababa, and sent her to Fale to stay there like a prisoner, lest I should live in my father's city of Harar or in the capital, Addis Ababa. He had ordered me by threat of force to go to Kaffa, pretending it was by way of an appointment, but as God in his goodness had caused Lijiasu to be deposed and us to be chosen, Queen Zaudi to, to Ethiopia's crown and throne, and me as Ethiopia's crown prince and regent plenipotentiary, we marveled at this and lived in amity and concord. Previous to that, on 17th Meskerem 1909, 27th September 1916, the officers with the troops, the archbishop and the Itchage with the priest, being assembled together 
in preferring advice while choosing the queen for crown and throne and me for the succession to the throne and the regency plenipotentiary had defined for us the following allocation of duties for our establishment and our work. 1. That the queen should take the honor of crown and throne and be called queen of queens. 2. That I, being called crown prince of Ethiopia, should beyond that take the regency plenipotentiary and carry out in full all the work of government. 3. That I, selecting the officers of the army, should appoint and dismiss them. 4. That I, sitting in court, should judge all the civil and criminal appeals which the judges had hand down in the first instance. 5. That I should conclude by negotiations any matters whatsoever concerning relations with foreign governments. After we had carried on for about a year, undertaking in accord the work that had been assigned and given to us, some men who were seeking their own profit alone came between us and set about attempting to destroy our unity and to estrange us from each other. What they told the queen as principal proof of their contention with, was that if appointments and dismissals and all the other aspects of government remained in the hands of the crown prince, there would be no one who would fear and respect the queen, for it was necessary that the authority of the queen should enter in the appointment of army officers and ministers, in ba and the balancing of provincial governorships, and the establishment of hereditary land rights, in the allocation of money, and in all the similar matters. They sought to establish that judicial decisions which those who acted as judges had handed down should not after they had come before me on appeal, be upset against them. They therefore told the queen that it would be good if she sat in court pretending that it was for the sake of the queen's honor. The object of all this was to see that old habits should not be changed and education not be developed. Apart from this, everything I was doing I intended to be for the dignity of the realm and for the prosperity and welfare of the people. Yet they were talking to the queen by in interpreting all this in a bad way and by dissimulating to her. For example, 1. When I granted a contract to a French company called Bayard, thinking that it would be of great advantage to government and people if the minerals existing in Ethiopia were extracted by it from where they lie buried, they spread the rumor as if we had by this inflicted damage upon our country. 2. If airplanes were introduced into our country, then it might be with the object of scaring off and frightening some idlers who were disturbing the country's security. When, therefore, I arranged for an airplane to arrive that had been purchased from France with the intention that it should expedite, expedite, expedite the turn round of postal services and transport of people in each province, they spread it about that this was to destroy by plane the entire queen's party and to deprive her by force of crown and throne. Moreover, I encountered great trouble in setting free the slaves. As to these men who were speaking to the queen under false pretenses and coming between us, at times she would follow their counsel without examining its usefulness to the government, yet useful to themselves. Hence, I had great trouble in carrying out the work of government according to my plans. Nevertheless, some great noblemen, notably Ras Casa, would speak to the queen, as they were saddened at the work of government being frustrated by the fraudulent advice of a few men and at, at our remaining behind in civilization. They convinced her of the usefulness for us in carrying out the work of government according to the assignment we had been given when the queen and I were first chosen. She therefore disregarded most of the advice tendered to her by others. Chapter 12 About the improvement by ordinance and proclamation of internal administration and about the efforts to allow foreign civilization to enter Ethiopia. Ever since the 17th Meskerem 1909, 27 September 1916, when I became Crown Prince of Ethiopia and Regent Plenipotentiary, until now, in 1928, that is to say 1935, when this greater danger came upon us by the violent activity which Italy unleashed against us, we did not cease to struggle to the utmost extent possible for everything that appeared to us to render honor to the government and prosperity to the people. 
although we appointed ministers for all the work, there was yet a great deal of thought and effort required of us, since the ultimate responsibility was ours. Moreover, according to the custom of Ethiopian kings, which has survived from antiquity, we sat in court two days in every week, Wednesday and Friday, as it was a principal aspect of our work to adjudicate cases on appeal. Thus, we had no time for respite. Apart from the minor chores which we carried out daily and apart from what we have forgotten because of the lapse of time, the following is some of the major work which we now remember. 1. Prior to 1909, that is to say 1916, ministers had been appointed for all the work of government, but no proper allocation of duties in writing had been given to them for all their work, and as they did not have adequate office accommodation, it was in their private houses that they frequently carried on their ministerial business. But from 1913, that is to say 1920, onwards the operations of government were gradually straightened out as we imported from Europe regulations and books which were suitable for all their works and as we arranged for offices to be built for each of the ministers and provided them with some foreign advisers whom we assigned to their ministerial activities. 2. The entire situation in the courts did not work out equitably, but from 1914, that's to say 1921 onwards, we provided each court with written regulations and reference books, and consequently, things gradually improved very much. Moreover, by virtue of our causing to stop the cutting off of hands and feet, which had been laid down in the Fethanegesht and had been customary for a very long time, and of similar cruel punishments, our whole people were very pleased. 3. The customs as regards punishment, which had persisted since ancient times, was that if a man had committed a criminal act, the judge had the power to do as he pleased. If the punishment was in terms of money, he could decrease or increase the fine. If it was in terms of imprisonment, he could shorten or lengthen the period of imprisonment, but there was no fixed punishment either in terms of fines or, or imprisonment. Thus, if the judge thought to benefit his friend by his judgment or to injure his enemy, there was no law that would prevent him from doing so. Consequently, if two men were caught having co committed the same crime, the judge was able, if he so desired, to punish one and to let off the other without punishment. But since 1923, that's to say 1930, we had established a criminal code which provided that every act that was criminal having been laid down in detail, whoever had committed a certain crime would pay such and such a fine or be imprisoned for such and such a period. Consequently, we saw to it that arrest and release according to the judge's whims ceased, i.e. that he could no longer benefit his friend and injure his enemy or impose fines as he pleased. Justice now took a road that had honor. Again, after a murderer had been condemned to death, either by confessing to the murder or by witness, witnesses testifying against him, he used to be handed over to the avenger, i.e. the victim's closest relative, who would, in front of the assembled people, kill him in any manner he wished, by battering him as he pleased and by increasing his anguish. But now, we have set up a special place where a murderer is to die and have arranged that the government executioner alone, without anyone seeing it, should kill him painlessly with a rifle that possesses a special aim. 4. With a view to having disputes settled in an improved manner when natives and foreigners were engaged in litigation, we caused from 1913, that's to say 1920, onwards, special courts to be established and appointed judges expert in the law, as we assigned to the judges foreign advisers knowledgeable in law and justice, the administration of justice greatly improved. The advisor appointed for this task was a native of Switzerland, A. M. Alberson. This grave accord affecting the honor of the country had been contained in the treaty which the French envoy, M. Klobukowski, had made with Emperor Menelik in 1900, that's to say 1907-1908. 5. 
as there did not exist in Ethiopia anything like an adequate printing press for books, all books had to be written by hand. Consequently, all the people had great difficulty in finding and in reading books. The reason was that it was not possible to make available to everybody books written by hand because the price was very high. From 1914, that's to say 1921-22, onwards we purchased from our private money two book printing presses and many books in Gittes and in Amharic with interpretation were printed. The entire people, therefore, derived much benefit from reading what they could buy at a low price. A weekly paper called Light and Peace and a monthly paper called Revealer of the Light were being printed by these presses. We gave the income of the printing houses and endowment to the Beit Saida Hospital. We desired other printing presses to be established with government money, and when it was handed over to the Marha Tebab Press, many books and stationery for the work of each ministry as well as all similar matters were printed there. The weekly paper called Aymero was also printed at this press. 6. Prior to 1915, which is to say 1922, there were no regulations as regards loans. Anyone who possessed money might lend it at an interest rate of 20 to 30 percent, and when the debtor did not have the money to pay, he would be arranged before a judge and would be handed over to the lender and be imprisoned until he paid his debt. But from 1915, which is to say 1922-1923 onwards, we ordered that the interest rate should be 9% and that anyone who accepted interest above that, above that should pay fine. If it turned out that the borrower did not have the money to pay and after it had been ascertained that he did not have cattle or hereditary land that could be sold by auction, we forbade by decree of 1916, that's to say 1923, that he be handed over to the lender. 7. At Addis Ababa and in other principal cities, lighting in each house was by gas or tallow or wax candle, but there was no electric light. The service, which had started to some extent in 1909, that's to say 1916-1917, had by 1915, which is to say 1922-1923, produced excellent electric light in the palace and in the offices of ministers in the house of the nobility and alongside along the side of the great Ras Makonin Avenue, in the major churches, and in the cities of Harar and Deradawa, and in the government buildings of Desi and Debra Marcos. 8. Previously, the sons of foreign kings and princes used not to come to Ethiopia, but since 1916, that is to say 1923-1924, because we had directed that foreign civilization should enter the country, the sons of foreign royalty and princes would come to Ethiopia for a visit. Chief among these were the Duke of Gloucester, son of the English King His Majesty George V, the Swedish Crown Prince Gustav Adolf, the uncle of the Italian King His Majesty Victor Emmanuel, the Duke of Abruzzi, the Savoy Prince Da Udain. 9. Prior to 1915, that's to say 1922, apart from one motor car, there were hardly any number of cars and lorries in Ethiopia, and since from the emperor downwards, it was by horse or by mule that the nobles, as well as the people, proceeded. And as the transport of goods and similar things was carried on beast of burden, it took a long time to reach a planned destination. But since 1915, that's to say 1922, we had seen to it that many cars, motorcycles, bicycles, and lorries were imported. Consequently, Operations of all kinds were gradually accelerated. 10. Up to 1915, that's to say 1922, the Star of Solomon and of Ethiopia were the only two kinds of metals, but now we caused a gold chain to be made for the Solomon Order, and it was to be awarded to foreign kings who had the rank corresponding to that of emperor. We also had an order with gold chain made called the Queen of Sheba Order which is awarded to the queen consort and to foreign queens. In addition to this, we had orders of very high rank made, called the Manulic Second and the Trinity Order, all as well as a military medal and arts and science medals in their various ranks. Many people were awarded these orders. 
11, there were few people who could speak foreign languages because there was only one school, the Menelik Second School, at Addis Ababa in which instruction in foreign languages was offered. But since 1917, which is to say 1924, we established at Addis Ababa and the other major city schools for instruction in foreign languages. In addition to the schools which existed before, we gave permission and aid to various missions and consequently language schools were opened in each province. Furthermore, since many boys who we had sent abroad had been properly educated, many of them were now able to work in the offices and of various ministries. 12. As there was only one hospital called the Menulik Second Hospital in existence at Addis Ababa, it was not sufficient to protect the health of the entire population. But from 1915, which is to say 1922 onwards, we had many hospitals established at Addis Ababa and the other major cities. We gave permission and financial aid to various missions and, as hospitals were being built, the health of many people began to be safeguarded. Furthermore, we had arranged to have the Swedish physician M. Hanner ap appointed to the hospital which we had named Beit Saida and which we had established at Addis Ababa with our private money. The hospital's name became well known and widely respected. 13. In previous times, all men who were soldiers were so only by custom, but there was no military school. But from 1911, which is to say 1918, 1919, Onwards, we established a military college and saw to it that the soldiers should learn the entire military craft at the college. In addition to this, we set up under the auspices of our son Maconan, Duke of Harar, a Boy Scouts movement so that boys should carry out their duties well. 14. In the past, there, were, there was only a flag with a lion and the three colors, but from 1920, that's to say 1927, 1928 onwards, we commanded that the emperor's daily and ceremonial flag, while unchanged in the three colors, should differ in the design of the lion and in the gold ornamentations, that the flag of the queen and of the crown prince and of the army and the postal service as well as for ships should be distinct in orna ornamentation and shape, while unchanged in the three colors. 15. At any time, foreign national anthems could be heard in Ethiopia on a gramophone, but there was nothing that might be called Ethiopia's national anthem. But now, since 1920, which is to say 1927-1928, there has appeared a distinct Ethiopian national anthem, and much to Farai, a military march. It is to be heard at the, at the palace and any other appropriate place. When Ethiopian envoys go abroad and a reception or banquet is given in their honor. When foreign envoys come to Ethiopia, we arrange to have their national anthem played at a re reception or banquet in their honor. 16. Since 1900, which is to say 1907, there had been set up at Addis Ababa the Bank of Abyssinia under the auspices of the National Bank of Egypt. But apart from this one bank, there was no other. The excess over and above the profit stipulated in the treaty when this bank of Abyssinia was set up belonged exclusively to the company. Consequently, the position was very difficult for the government and the people. Therefore, in 1920, which is to say 1927-1928, we invested our own private money in shares and made the nobles and the people shareholders as far as possible. We then bought the Bank of Abyssinia, having paid off its entire deficit and consequently having designed, designated it the Bank of Ethiopia, there turned out to be great advantage in this move. 17. Prior to 1920, which is to say 1927-1928, the word aeroplane was not very well known in Ethiopia, but from 1920, which is to say 1927-1928 onwards, some aeroplanes having been purchased we brought them to Ethiopia, and subsequently many difficulties for government and people were gradually elevated, alleviated. 18. Since there were no Ethiopian legations or consulates in foreign countries, a special envoy had to be sent for every matter concerned with foreign governments, or a, for, or a foreign representative having been specially delegated had to deliver the message. 
but since 1921, which is to say 1928-1929, we ordered legations to be established with the neighboring governments and consulates with the far-off ones. All government business was, therefore, dispatched without trouble. 19. As the import of war materials into Ethiopia had been prohibited, the number of worthless idlers in each province increased. But since from 1920, which is to say 1927, 1928 onwards, it was permitted by treaty that we may purchase arms for the protection of the country. Security and peace were established in Ethiopia by, by virtue of our directions to destroy these faithless men by supplying arms to those protecting the country in each district. We cannot forget at the time when it was permitted to import these war materials into Ethiopia, the objection of the Italian envoy arguing that the Ethiopian government should not be allowed war planes. This proves that, having destroyed peace, the Italians have been planning and preparing for a long time to make war on Ethiopia. 20. As it has been claimed that it is forbidden by law that bishops be appointed, chosen from among the priors who are natives of Ethiopia, Ethiopians still remain in the position of not being appointed. But since 1920, which is to say 1927-1928, we have emphasized the large number of Ethiopia's provinces and the fact that all believers in Christ are not such by innate dis distinctiveness, but by virtue of conduct. And because, after discussions, we had succeeded in making this point, we caused the appointment to the dignity of bishop of five priors, chosen from among Ethiopian nationals, and assigned them to their di diocese. 21. Previously, there had not existed the custom to invite the, the dispatch of special envoys from foreign governments to attend the coronation of the emperor. But now that we have seen to it that Ethiopia should progress on the path to ever higher civilization, and that she should strengthen the ties of friendship with foreign governments. When therefore we were crowned emperor on 23rd Dekemt, 1923, which is 2nd November 1930, the representatives of 12 governments came to Addis Ababa and honored our coronation. This proves Ethiopia's ascent to a higher level during our time. 22. The emperor used to carry out, in accordance with his own wishes and directions, any sort of peaceful and military operations, as well as the administration of the country, and anything else like this. But now, on the 9th of Hamlin, 1923, which is to say 16th July, 1931, we, we promulgated a constitution, set up a parliament, appointed senators, and caused deputies to be selected. We appointed presidents for these and directed all and directed that all the business of government should be carried out on the basis of advice from Parliament. 23. The Emperor or the nobles used to retain a large army contingent while moving from one province to another, and the people were forced to produce provisions without payment, such as food, forage, and wood. But since 1923, which is to say 1930-1931, we prohibited by proclamation that the peasants be forced to hand over any of their property except voluntarily and against and against payment. 24. As the number of country districts to which telephone and telegraph communications had been extended was rather small, it took a long time to bring to an end at the difficulties which the government, trade, and the people experienced in every province. Later on, however, because we had directed that telephones be extended to every district and postal communications be established, the difficulties for the government and the people were gradually greatly alleviated. 25. The places at which criminals were being imprisoned used not to possess the cleanness, cleanliness corresponding to health requirements, but since 1925, which is to say 1932-1933, we provided, having built it with our private money, a house that possessed washing and clinical facilities corresponding to health requirements as well as instruction in reading and writing and manual work. The fettering of criminals by iron and chain fixed at their feet having ceased, we ordered that they be guarded by warders. 26. Every man who possessed land in addition to the taxes fixed and payable annually used to be forced to pay additional money on various occasions and to be liable to forced labor without pay. 
But now, apart from the taxes fixed and payable once a year, we prohibited by regulation and proclamation anyone to work forced labor without pay or to render any other excess dues. 27. Needless to say, in Europe there existed wireless telegraphy. Clearly audible wireless services were not known in Ethiopia. But since 1924, which is to say 1931, we had given orders for wireless telegraphy to be established at Addis Ababa and other major provinces. Hence, every aspect of government business, of trade, and other matters was speedily accomplished, both inland and abroad. In 1928, which is to say 1935-1936, at the time when we had to fight against Italy, the service was of great benefit. 28. Prior to 1920, that's to say 1927, 1928, no civil or military uniform indicative of rank had been specified, hence everybody wore the same kind of uniform. But later on, as we had directed that distinctions of rank be made in civil and military dress, the seniority of rank civil or military could be recognized by the uniform. 29. For the past hundred years or so, if someone was robbed of money or of other possessions and chattels, there were men from a family related by descent or by marriage who claimed to be able to find the thief by giving a drink or of medicine to a boy under the age of 15. These men used to live wandering about to, at Addis Ababa and in all other districts by seeking thieves. With the permission of the government administering the medicine and receiving payment from people who had lost money, they would claim to have found the thief if the boy to whom they administered the medicine went and entered a man's house and lay on the bed in a trance, or seized the man hitting him with his knees or forcefully and lay upon him. If things were done in this way, the man was seized by force by the procedure alone without there being any indications of witnesses to the theft and was under an obligation to make payment to the owner who had lost his property since deeds like this were being carried out by lies and fraud they were in a position to hypnotize the liabisha and to introduce him into the house of an innocent man who had not stolen anyone's property or to arrest and oppress people by causing the boy to hit someone and to lie upon him in a trance but afterwards we gave orders for the liabisha method to seize, as we were convinced after proper investigation of the fact that it was impossible to find a thief by administering medicine, unless a theft like this had been subject to, to an examination by a judge or proper evidence or witnesses. Consequently, there was great rejoicing in every province, as we had protected the people from the iniquities that came upon them in this matter. 30. Although in Ethiopia the emperor was supreme, feudal rule had not ceased. But from 1910, which is to say 1917-1918 onwards, since we had become convinced that the rule of the landed gentry was detrimental to government and people, we stopped the landed gentry in Walo, Gojam, Begameder, Yaju, Walega and Jima and caused other servants of our government to be selected and to be appointed. 31. It had remained customary in Ethiopia for all provincial governors to be military chiefs, but there were no civil rulers. Therefore, it was not the custom for the whole country to be under the authority of the government and to allocate taxes collected by civilian officials to the army and for other government business. But the governors used to pay the soldiers through their own officers and to give them quarters in their governorate as we were busy about abolishing all at once this custom which had persisted for a long time thinking that it might provoke disturbances in the country we arranged to demonstrate this mode of procedure and to make it acceptable in slow stages by placing under the authority of the central government the districts of Chijaga, Techar, 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 Bale, Walega, Sayo, and Jima, and we also saw to it, as an instructive example, that the revenue should be applied to the expenditure on the army and other government business. 32. Because until about 10 years ago roads in the various provinces had not been properly made up, there was inevitably a great deal of wasted time and money in traveling from one region to another. 
but for the past 10 years, as we were convinced of the benefit of roads to government and the people, we gave orders that the roads leading from Addis Ababa to the east and west to the north and south be properly maintained. Hence, districts that could previously be reached in 10 or 15 days can now be reached in 2 or 3 days by car and lorry.